Good evening, everyone. It's great to have you back, and hope that we will have a great evening together as we learn more about the intertestamental period. As we start tonight, I would like to read from Galatians chapter 5, starting with verse 26 and going into chapter 4. And I won't do this very long. I would like to not keep you longer than the two hours that you have committed for this evening. And Paul says, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What I'm saying is that as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave. Although he owns the whole estate, he is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. And then I want you especially to listen to Chapter 4, verse 4. But when the time had fully come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent His Spirit, the Spirit of His Son, into our hearts. The Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. You can read everywhere there's the word son. You can read child or son and daughter if you wish. But Paul is making a point. The point being that God has adopted us into his family and that we are his sons. He's writing specifically against the background of uh, a Jewish Gentile tension where Jews would say we are children of God and Gentiles cannot be saved. So against that sort of background, Paul is confirming the fact that God through Jesus Christ, has opened up the door so that anyone and everyone can have a relationship with God. But specifically for this evening, what I want to highlight is that one verse. Because all of this happened, and and Paul uses the illustration of a son and a slave. And he says, at the time set by the father, then the son will inherit everything. So That's by... Uh, virtue of the uh, last will and testament and so on of the father. That, that's the normal illustration that he's using. The application that he is making is that at the time set by the father, Jesus came into this world and he became a human being, born uh, in a stable, ultimately died on the cross and rose from the dead in order to provide us with salvation. It's especially in the words that, that, that we read where Paul says, in the fullness of time, which is an older translation, or when the time had fully come, uh, that I want to highlight the topic of tonight, which is looking at how I personally believe strongly how God prepared the world for the coming of Jesus the Messiah. And, and in, hold on to that, because by the end of this lecture today, or this evening, I, I trust that I would have made that point very clear. Let's pray together. Our Father... We thank you for an opportunity to study. We thank you that you confirm in your word that if we know Jesus, your son, then we are also your children. And that we can, through your spirit, cry out, Abba, Father, giving us that intimate relationship and access to you. And we want to thank you for that. Thank you that you have taken a step in our direction by reaching out to us, although we have sinned against you. And thank you, Lord, that you've given a desire to all of us to study more and to know more about you, to know more about your word. Thank you that you've given us the Bible. And as we learn more about the Bible and the background of the Bible, Lord, I pray that you would lead and guide us in in, in our growth, in our spiritual growth as we grow closer to you and continue to establish and grow our relationship with you through through the working of your spirit in our lives. Bless us. Today as we gather, Lord, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. The previous lecture. Last week we looked at the history of Israel. And um, I have written some uh, dates on on the whiteboard. And I'm going to test your knowledge in just a a few moments. And um, I'm not going to get you to write a test or anything. But we essentially covered 
the history of Israel. From uh, about 2000, uh, there was the prehistory that dates back to Abraham or before Abraham. Uh, we can't date much of that, especially not in terms of uh, the Old Testament uh, and the scriptures. Um, there are other dates available, but that was not the focus of our study. Looking at roughly the year 2000 when Abraham was called, and then we follow that history uh, of Israel all the way up to the end of the historical section of the Old Testament. We then skipped over the intertestamental period, and tonight we're going to come back to that. And then we very, very briefly looked at the first hundred years, the birth of Christ, um, the expansion of the church, uh, and, and that actually makes for a, a complete different study, uh, a study called church history, essentially. And it, church history, the study of church history starts with that first century AD, and then it moves along and uh, studies how the church has expanded uh, around the world. And uh, we stopped our study looking at Israel in particular with two different wars that, that were fought in our era. The one was roughly 66 to 70 and just over, just beyond 70 uh, AD and 70 AD, uh, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans and the Romans annihilated the Jewish armies and rebels uh, another 100 years or less than 100 years later uh, when they... Uh, attacked again, the, uh, again attacked the Roman, uh, Roman armies uh, under the leadership of Bar Kokhba at the time. At that particular occasion, the Jews sim simply were annihilated by the Romans. Uh, and that sort of brought the uh, church or the biblical history to a, to a large extent to an, to an end. Now, there's a whole other study around Israel and what happened to Israel. We don't have time to go into that, but if ever you visit Israel, it would be good for you to not only study this biblical history, but also to study the history of Israel, the, the country of Israel, and whatever happened to it, and how it changed hands from time to time, and how the Muslims entered into the country, uh, and then eventually the Ottoman regime, and then with the world war it was set free and ultimately 1948 the establishment of modern the state of the of modern israel and so on it's a very very interesting study but we don't have time to go uh, into that we also looked at the fact last week that archaeology assists us in discovering more and more about the bible but it doesn't tell us everything in fact we will probably all of us go to our grave or when jesus returns uh, without knowledge of many, many things in the Bible. Uh, we can only know so much, given what we have in the Word of God, uh, which is essentially a faith statement. It is not written as history per se, although it uses history to tell us how God revealed Himself. But then uh, archaeology has been used to confirm many of the facts in the Bible. And so we have looked at that particular study last week. Now tonight we're going to focus on that intertestamental period. Uh, and we will look at, at what happened to Israel during the last 400 years or so before Jesus uh, was born. And then we're going to set Israel's history during this time in the context of the relevant world events around them. And this is something that I've tried to highlight uh, something that I needed to discover at a rather older age, I would say. Uh, growing up thinking Israel was the only nation in the world and, and, and uh, country in the world, but then discovering there were actually many other nations and many activities around Israel that are not necessarily the focus of the, the Old Testament. They are described uh, to some extent or referred to, but they're not the focus. Uh, but when you study them, then this whole history unfolds before your eyes. So that is uh, where we're heading for tonight. But before we go any further, I want you to turn your piece of paper around, find an empty space somewhere, and write down um, the first 33 books of the Old Testament. If you feel comfortable in doing so, start with Psalms. Um, in other words, by now you really should have Genesis all the way to Psalms under, the, under your belt. So if you want to, just write down the last few of those books and test yourself and see if you actually can remember the names of the books of the Old Testament. And again, I encourage you to use abbreviations uh, so that you can write quicker and faster. Uh, there are 39 books in the Old Testament. We only have another six to go. So next week you will know all the names of the Old Testament books. I'm going to start with Psalms, um, and following Psalms is Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. <clears throat> it now becomes a little bit more difficult, as I said last week. We, we're, we're now leaving the historical section, which is a sort of a logical flow. Uh, 
and then uh, from, from Ecclesiastes, a song of songs. That way, that's where we stopped last week. This week, there are four major prophets. It's Isaiah, Jeremiah. After Jeremiah is a wisdom book, which is called Lamentations. And then the third major prophet is Ezekiel, and the fourth one uh, is Daniel. Those are regarded as the major prophets. And then we're into the minor prophets. And the minor prophets... Uh, And I'm going to read it just so that um, I don't make any mistakes. But it's Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, and Micah. And so I trust that you had a 90% uh, good record there, uh, if you mark yourself. Just go through this exercise. Um, I will be uh, testing you probably in the exam on the names of the books of the Bible as well, because this is part of the exercise for those registered for the Certificate of Completion. Okay, it brings us back to the history and the intertestamental period. It's uh, become very uh, common to refer to that as the silent years. The reason for that is that the last of the authentic prophets that we have in the Old Testament is Malachi. Um, And and again, there are arguments about the date of Malachi, but I'm not going to go into that. We'll talk about that in more detail uh, when we do the second module. But Malachi represents the last of the authentic prophets. After that, many people, as you know by now, have written, and so there are written documents available. Uh, And we've looked at the Apocrypha, and and that's just a a sample of of some of the written activity or writing activity at the time. But the interesting thing is that Jews, and later on the Christians, do not acknowledge any of the additional writings as authentic word of God, or part of the canon. And so, it has become customary for the Jews and Christians to refer to the time after Malachi as the silent years, in in, in a sense referring to the fact that God has not authentically spoken to his nation. At least they have not received anything. Now, does that mean that God was inactive? Well, by all means, no. God was was 100% active and working in this world, in preparing the world for the coming of Jesus the Messiah. Now, if you want to do some reading, an additional reading, in our textbooks, Johnston is the only one that really has a section on the intertestamental period. Uh, In your New Bible Dictionary or any other kind of dictionary, uh, there are uh, plenty of uh, books and references that you can look at. But uh, titles such as the Maccabees or Pharisees, Sadducees, all of those providers with a bit of a backdrop and a background to the New Testament, and we'll talk about them tonight. Ptolemy or the Ptolemies, those were rulers in Egypt and we'll talk about them. Alexander the Great makes a wonderful study, as um, will any of the other uh, eras or people or groups or or empires. Uh, You can read up on any of those in either the dictionary or on the internet or wherever. If you are following any of this in the Holman Bible Atlas, then chapters 13 to 17 Uh, tell you more about this particular time uh, in the the life and in the history of Israel. By way of background, just to refresh your memory, I wonder if you can recall some of the dates that I have already written on the board. And this is is not on a scale, as you will immediately see. I'm covering uh, one and a half thousand uh, years in the first section on the left on 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 uh, uh, on the whiteboard. So... 2000, we've talked about that already, so I'll give that to you and not ask you to answer. But this is Abraham. What happened roughly 1750? Anybody? Sorry? Joseph. Joseph went to Egypt roughly that time. Count another 400 years and you are into, and, and these are give and take dates, but you, you see 1250 is the date that I personally prefer uh, it's the later date for the Exodus, as well as around about that same time, give or take another 40 years, of the entrance into the land of Canaan. What happened in 1050 BC? Samuel, Saul, David. That's when the kings came onto the scene. 922, a very, very important date. It can also be 932. If you, it depends on, or 931, depends on which source you're reading, but the dates differ or vary by about 10 years. I have opted for 922, given one of the sources um, that I have personally been using, which is uh, the New Bible Dictionary. But 922, what happened? The split of the kingdom, north and south. So from that point on, there were two 
timelines. The one referring to Israel in the north with Samaria as the capital city. The other one in the south, which, had, which was called Judah, uh, and it had Jerusalem as the capital city. What happened in 722? Samaria was destroyed uh, under the Assyrian uh, Empire or by the Assyrian armies. Um, Samaria was taken in, people taken into captivity. 586, to refresh your memory, the Judah fell and Jerusalem fell. Uh, by this time, the Assyrians were overtaken by the Babylonians. The Babylonians are in power. They establish their empire, and Nebuchadnezzar comes, and he destroys Jerusalem as well as the temple. And it brings to an end uh, of what has become known as the First Temple Era. The Jews, or the people from Judah, most of the, the top echelon people go into exile. And in 538, the Babylonians, in turn, are overthrown by the Persians and Cyrus is the first king of the Persians and follows a different philosophy and policy and he says to people you want to go you can go home and many people take that opportunity and in the book of Ezra we, we read how Zerubbabel uh, and, and others after him came uh, back to Jerusalem they started rebuilding the temple the temple was only completed in 515 515 that introduces the second temple era, which is the era that we are going to study tonight, uh, essentially. And so we're going to look at what happened during that particular time. And then in 445, which is the last actual date, plus 12 years, uh, so you need to minus 12 from 445, and you'll get the, the last uh, dated reference in the Old Testament, and that is Nehemiah coming to Jerusalem as the governor, He's been appointed as the governor over Judah, or the province of Judea, and he builds the wall around Jerusalem. And he remains in Jerusalem for 12 years. He tells us that he remained that long. Then he went back to Babylon to report to his king, and then he came back to Jerusalem again, but he doesn't give us any dates uh, to actually date it more precisely uh, than that. So when you come towards the end of um, Oh, towards the year 400, the end of the 5th century BC, then in terms of the Bible detail or the details in our biblical uh, texts uh, disappear. And uh, we then have to rely on extra biblical literature uh, to do that. Now, we have bits and pieces of information from the books of Esther, um, which describes the story of Esther and Mordecai, but it doesn't help us with any of the dating uh, whatsoever. In fact, um, if you're a critical scholar, you will doubt that Esther ever lived um, because there's no reference to her anywhere else. And, and some of the critical scholars will say something to the tune of, now, such an important event as the king finding himself another wife. Why is that not described in the archives of the, of the Persians, for example? She lives during the, the Persian era. And the same thing with uh, Daniel. Daniel provides us with a bit more information, uh, but Daniel was removed from Jerusalem even before the fall of Jerusalem in, in uh, 597 or, or rather 605 or so, uh, at one of the first attacks of the Babylonians on, on Jerusalem. Daniel was in that group who was removed uh, to go to, to Babylon. And so he tells us the story, and Daniel lives right throughout the Babylonian uh, period, uh, 586 and beyond, until the Persians took over, and Daniel still has some activity there. So again, you can fit Daniel into the picture, but it doesn't help us much in terms of providing much more information uh, about what happened. We're entirely dependent on the extra-biblical literature for our knowledge of the period from 400, roughly 400, uh, to the birth of Jesus Christ. Now, tonight I'm going to summarize the history for you, which I have done last week as well. The moment you summarize, you, you, you're in danger of oversimplifying it. And, and I can really only touch uh, and scratch the surface and give you the headings, sort of the headlines of what actually happened. If you want to know more, there's a lot more written about every single aspect or era of the history of Israel and the history of that time in the ancient uh, Middle East. Uh, but tonight, I'm going to take a broad strokes type approach. And when you tell history in that way, uh, there is an, there's a particular angle and a bias. 
And my angle and bias is learning more about what happened to the country and the people of Israel during this time. Because ultimately when Jesus is born, he's born in Palestine, in Israel. And so I want to know what happened to this country during that particular time. Uh, there's a lot more about all the other nations, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and, and so forth. Uh, but those things you will have to study up and, and look up for yourself. But it does help us to get that overall picture. And the dates, as I mentioned the dates, and as you read your notes, um, the dates are all before Christ, all B.C., uh, uh, unless I state it differently, right towards the end we may get into uh, the New Testament era and then I will make sure that you understand that this is A.D., uh, our era and not B.C. And a couple of quotes that I use, uh, use the, the abbreviation B.C.E. Last week I told you it stands for Before the Common Era and that's simply because they want to avoid offending perhaps those who are non-Christian or atheist or don't believe in Jesus Christ or whatever. And so they use a more common uh, general term for that. In terms of our sources of information, we get those from the Apocrypha, primarily uh, the one book, First Maccabees. It provides us with a history of a particular era, and we are going to look at that history uh, tonight. And, and it helps us to get that picture. It's written pretty much in the style of Samuel, Kings, Chronicles, uh, and so forth. Then we also get some information from the Pseudepigrapha, but they are not reliable, especially when they start referring to actual historical events. They're not reliable. They, uh, I told you last week or two weeks ago, they are wild and wonderful uh, in their thinking and the thoughts and the descriptions. And therefore, they are unreliable historical sources. They do provide us with a bit of an understanding of the cultural backdrop against which we need to read the, the story of the Bible towards the end and then also where the New Testament starts kicking in. The Dead Sea Scrolls, again, they are uh, dated about 100, at the latest 100 BC. They can even be older than that, but that plongs them right in the middle of our 400-year period. Uh, but they do not describe history. They describe uh, the life and the beliefs of a particular community, and we are going to look at that community or those kinds of communities in, in one slide. Uh, later on, it's called the Essenes, and those were sort of ascetic groups who, who distanced themselves from the rest of Judaism at the time, and in particular, they were rejecting Jerusalem because of all the sins and the wrongs they believed that happened in Jerusalem. So we, they withdrew from society, and here in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have... We have the ref a reflection of one such community and how they believed uh, you became part of their community. So their rules and regulations are all described for us. And so they don't provide us with history as such, but they provide us with a, a cultural backdrop and an understanding of how people worked and, and, uh, and believed and, and lived in those days. The works of jo Josephus, again, Josephus is biased. Uh, he lives in our era, in the first hundred years uh, of, of A.D., and uh, he writes up the history, and obviously um, he, he looks back over many, many years, and he refers to some history, historical information, which is very, very valuable, but it's not always certain how reliable Josephus uh, in particular is. And then, of course, we have the literature from contemporary empires. You have the Assyrian documents, the Babylonian documents, and, and all sorts of other documents, primarily uncovered by archaeologists. And these things have been studied back to front by all sorts of people, scholars who know a lot more than, than I do. And uh, they have put together the histories of these different empires and nations. And that really provides us the broader picture uh, in which Israel uh, needs to be under, uh, understood. Uh, against the background uh, that Israel needs to be understood in those days. Uh, we also, um, I already mentioned the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. Daniel provides us with prophetic insight in terms of the future. He describes particular years, he refers to 70 years um, in, that we find in the book of Jeremiah. And then in his dreams and visions, he sees pictures about the unfolding of history. And when you go into the 400 years before Christ, all the way up to um, the, the Greek Empire, the Alexander the Great, uh, Daniel provides information about that in visionary format. Uh, 
Um, he describes it as prophetic. Again, if you're a very critical scholar, you will say, this is another person who wrote in retrospect and then placed the words in Daniel's mouth, as if Daniel were seeing visions and so on. So it all depends on the angle that you take. I, I take a conservative approach, and I believe Daniel had these visions, uh, but Daniel doesn't write historical information. He writes prophetic, visionary information. He provides us with visionary uh, information, which you can take and, and match with the history as it played out uh, eventually. Now, the political shift during this time, I'm going to back up into the Assyrian Empire just to provide us a bit of the backdrop so that we understand, uh, briefly understand, something of the historical context of the events that eventually took place during those 400 years. Now, the power shifts affecting the Jews during the last half of the first millennium before Christ can be summarized in the following way. And uh, you've got this in your notes, but let me just go through it briefly. The Assyrian Empire, in fact, I'll point out in a moment, it is the third, the so-called new Assyrian Empire. There were three different time slots in history when the Assyrians dominated the world, including Palestine. And as I pointed out before and showed you on a map, Palestine was a tiny, tiny little speck in the world of, of the Middle East at that particular time. But from 911 to 612, in 612, uh, Nineveh fell. Nineveh was destroyed by the Babylonians, and the Assyrian Empire came to an end. The Babylonian Empire lasted from 612 BC to 538, 538 being uh, one of the dates on, on our whiteboard there. The Persians took over, Cyrus the Great, Cyrus the King, and in 538 all the way to 332, when Alexander the Great came onto the scene and in a very short space of time swept across the whole world. In fact, he established a far bigger empire than even that of the Assyrians and of the Babylonians. Um, and he died in 320. He left his kingdom, uh, his empire, to four of his generals, as we will, I will highlight this uh, also in a moment. Uh, but he left it to four of them. And what is important for us is the next two phases in the life of Israel. First of all, it was the Egyptian generals, and they are called the Ptolemies, and we'll, we'll talk about them in a moment. Uh, but, but they dominated Israel for the period 320 to 200, so about 120 years long. And then the Syrians took over, and they drove back the Egyptians, uh, or the Egyptian rulers at the time, and they took over, and they dominated Palestine. So the dates that you see uh, in your notes and on the screen are actually dates related to Israel and how it impacted Israel. And then Israel was under Syrian domination. And so literally from the Babylonian Empire, uh, both Israel uh, to the Assyrian Empire, uh, Israel paid homage and tax taxes, and then the, the Babylonians dominated the scene, and even Judah paid taxes, although they maintained some of their independence all the way to 586. From that point on, the Jews never had independence again until the Hasmonean era, which is 142 to 63 BC. And in 63 BC, the Romans came in and they took over uh, the country. And from that point on, all the way 63 to 476 AD, they dominated that whole era, that, that whole area uh, the, in, in the Roman Empire, but, but, but Palestine being included in that. So that gives you a, a little bit of a brief summary. And now I'm going to back up and slowly just go through that once again. Here is a quote from Wikipedia related to the Assyrians by way of background. In the Middle Bronze Age, Assyria was a region on the upper Tigris River, named for its original capital, the ancient city of Assur. Later, as a nation and empire, that, became, uh, that came to control all of the Fertile Crescent, Egypt and much of Anatolia, the term Assyria proper referred to roughly the northern half of Mesopotamia. Uh, with Nineveh as its capital. And here are the three re uh, time frames that I referred to already. There's the old Assyrian Empire from the 20th to the 15th centuries BC, the middle uh, empire 15th to the 10th, and then from 911 to 612, we're talking about the new Assyrian Empire. It is this empire, this latter one, that demolished Samaria and took those people into uh, captivity. The Assyrians were very innovative people at the time, and archaeology, archaeological digs uh, and discoveries have unearthed many of their inventions, such as 
Assyrian invented excavation to undermine city walls. Uh, for example, they were the first ones to be able to do that. They also designed battering rams to knock down walls and gates, uh, a concept, the concept of a corps of engineers who breached rivers with uh, pontoons or provided soldiers with inflatable skins for swimming. So it's quite amazing back in those days, we're talking 3,000 years ago and longer, uh, that these people were so uh, innovative and clever the new Assyrian Empire, and on this map I need to show you roughly what happened. We have the initial Assyrian Empire with Ashur, the name Ashur right there, and there is the capital city Nineveh. Just in context, uh, Sidon, Tyre, and there's Jerusalem. So this little area there is Palestine. That's where the, Israel the Israelites lived uh, over there. But the region, initially the first empire was that sort of smaller section. The second era of empire included a much broader one, including Babylon in the south. And then the third one is all the light green that you can see all the way to the Persian Gulf and then all the way around to uh, the upper parts of Egypt. And that was the third Assyrian Empire. And it is this one that, as I said before, that destroyed uh, Samaria. The new Assyrian Empire under Tiglat Pileser the third, Shalmaneser, the fifth, and Sargon reached its pinnacle during the latter part of the 8th and the first half of the 7th uh, centuries BC. They were responsible for the fall of Samaria in 722, but Judah somehow escaped the attack. We believe, and as we read the story of the Bible, God protected them. Uh, they heard some news, the king heard some news back home, and he went back home. And actually, uh, if, my, if my memory serves me correctly, some of his sons came and actually uh, killed him. And so the Lord protected Judah and Jerusalem at that time. But Samaria fell uh, under their, uh, their armies. The Babylonian Empire, the Babylonians uh, came up from the south. And we have just looked at the map with Babylon um, in the south in the, in the modern day Iraq. There was an uprising uh, in the southeastern part of the empire in Babylon. And that started weakening the Assyrians after many years slowly pushing north, and in a final battle in 612, the Babylonians succeeded in destroying Nineveh, uh, never to be fully recovered again. The Babylonians also attacked Judah at that same time, and that happened in the last part of the 7th century, uh, in 605, 608, around about that time, and then they started pushing uh, again, uh, stamping their authority, and on a few occasions they came and, um, and subdued Jerusalem, uh, but in 586, Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed Jerusalem as well as the temple. Many Jewish leaders and people were taken into exile between those years. Then again in 597, and then again in 586, may, many people were taken into captivity. And the reason for that was to weaken the country. So you take the leadership away, and you leave them leaderless and powerless. Uh, and, and, and that philosophy actually worked for most of the nations at that particular time. The Persian period, 538 to 336. The Babylonian Empire lasted almost a century until Babylon was taken over by the Persians without anything like a war. It literally happened overnight. Uh, they were besieging the city and somehow they got access to the city overnight and the next morning when the people sort of woke up, the Persians were in the city of Babylon and they took over. They, they also therefore inherited the empire, uh, as it were. Cyrus, the first king, in 538, and he gave permission to the nations. That is described on that cylinder uh, in the background that you can see there. Uh, it is described, that, um, the, the same information that we have in the book of Ezra and in the, la in the last chapter of Second Chronicles. Uh, that information is confirmed in, in that cylinder. Some Jews went home to rebuild the temple. 515, the temple was completed. And then in 445, the wall of Jerusalem was rebuilt. The Jews experienced relative peace, but they were subjected. They, they now live under governors. They didn't have their king anymore. And it's important little, not just a little bit of information, it's an important part of the history of Israel to remember that at this particular point in time, there was no longer a king. Um, uh, there, there, there was perhaps evidence of a prince that came back from Babylon at the time, but because they were subject, subjected to and subject to the Persians or the Babylonians, whoever, uh, they didn't allow them to appoint their own king. And so over that period of time, and it's, it's, 
It's a, a, a mystery that we cannot resolve anymore because we don't know exactly how it happened. But the kings started disappearing into the background. And that also lays a foundation for what eventually would have become, and I will mention that later on as well, where the high priest in Jerusalem became more and more important. Um, where at one particular time you had the king and the priest, the high priest, and those roles never got confused. In fact, one of the kings actually got zapped by God because he tried to offer a sacrifice. And the priest came in and said, this is not allowed for you to do so. Only the priest can do so. Um, and and when, when, they, when we then enter into this intertestamental period, something changed in the life and the expectation of the nation of Israel where the king became not less important, but he no longer functioned because there was no king. But there was also always a desire, as I will point out later on, a desire on the part of the Jews to have their own king and to throw off the, the yoke of these foreign nations and then to have their king. And that is how the whole concept of a Messiah started developing among the Jews. They didn't have a physical king anymore, but it was a dream of theirs, a passion of theirs, to have their own king uh, one day. But during this time, they, they, they experienced relative peace. Nobody attacked them, nobody killed them, nobody persecuted them necessarily. And under the Assyrians and the Babylonians, and now under the Persians, they experienced relative peace. They could build their houses and do whatever, build the temple, have their sacrifices in there and worship with a very little problem. Then we enter into the Greek period. Under the Persians, during this time, the Greeks were there. Uh, it's just that we don't read in the Bible of them. Uh, but when you study the history, it's, it's like any history. There are all sorts of nations all around, but they seem to grow in power and strength uh, over time. And then strength or power dwindles down and another nation or another group sort of takes over. And that's exactly what has happened. So the Greeks were always there. Um, and, and Alexander the Great uh, did what, what few people, in fact, I personally believe nobody else was able to do ever since, ever before or ever since. And that is stamp his authority and the Greek culture on, on the world. And when you look at this particular map, you will see with uh, the Greek islands uh, over here and Macedonia. And uh, in a moment, we'll see how he was influenced by his father, uh, and the Macedonians, and the Greek culture. And from that particular point on, he started traveling uh, over, and when you follow the yellow line, all the way literally right through Judah, and, and into uh, Egypt, and then back again all the way east, uh, capturing Babylonia. And then he literally went all the way to India to establish the Greek empire. Now that's more than any of the previous empires uh, were able to do. From there he turned back again and you follow the blue line and you will see how he went back and when he arrived at Babylon and this all happened in 12 years time uh, traveling all the time with armies and gathering more and more people and soldiers as he went along mercenaries and all sorts of people joined him in that process but when he arrived in Babylon on the second trip there uh, he died uh, and, and that's, where, that's why the Greek Empire in a certain sense came to a, a, a quick standstill. And here's the story. Following the unification of the multiple city-states of ancient Greece under the rule of his father Philip II of Macedon, Alexander conquered the Archimedes Persian Empire, including Anatolia, Syria, Phoenicia, Judea, Gaza, uh, Egypt, uh, Bactria, and Mesopotamia, and extended the boundaries of his own empire as far as Punjab in India. Prior to his death, Alexander had already made plans for military and mercantile uh, expansions into the Arabian Peninsula, after which he was to turn his armies to the west. Carthage, Rome, Iberian Peninsula, uh, that, the, he had all of that already in mind. He was going to go there, and he would have succeeded. His original vision had been to the east, though, to the ends of the world, and the great outer sea, as described in his boyhood uh, tutor, Aristotle. But unfortunately, Alexander, well, unfortunately for him, Alexander came to a tragic end, uh, one of the most successful military le leaders. Um, he was born in 356, and he died in 323 at the age of 33 years old. Now, um, just wind it back uh, 12 years, and this guy started out when he was 21 years old. I mean, that is when he became the military leader that he was. And so it's a, it's a phenomenal story when you start reading about the, the Greek Empire. I'll try and pull all of that together ultimately as it applies to Palestine. 
Wikipedia in terms of his death. Uh, we don't know why he died, but this is what Wikipedia says, giving a bit of a summary. Alexander died after 12 years of constant military campaigning, possibly as a result of, and, and this, I mean, this is as wide as you can get, malaria poisoning, typhoid fever, viral encephalitis, or the consequences of alcoholism. And so you pick your choose, whatever. I mean, it can be anything. And so nobody really knows why Alexander the Great actually died. But he died in Babylon. And uh, that left no successor, um, and it meant that his, his whole empire needed to go somewhere. And his four generals, four of his generals took over, and more about that also now in a moment. But just to come back to the Jews, where, where did the Jews fit into this picture? As you look at the map, he just swept around the world in a very quick uh, succession of, of battles, uh, one battle after the, after the other. That Alexander is only mentioned by name in 1 Maccabees, which is more of the historical description in uh, chapter 1 verses 1 to 8 and 6 verse 2 and then also mentioned by Josephus and Josephus gives a, a rather grand description of, of Alexander arriving I mean El Josephus was a, was a fan of Alexander so he gives this grand description of how Alexander arrived and the Jews opened the gate and they welcomed him in and all the rest of it whether all of that is true is very difficult to determine as I said to you before Josephus had a particular angle uh, that, he, that he used in terms of writing his history. But Alexander moved from Greece, attacked Tyre, that was north of Israel and Syria, and then he took Palestine without any resistance. The Jews didn't want to support him initially, but they had nothing to, to offer, uh, no resistance to offer. So when Alexander arrived, um, he, they, they sim he simply walked over the country uh, virtually. Uh, Alexander requested help from the Jews uh, to take the Syrians. But uh, Jadua, who was the, the priest at the time, refused help. But then when Alexander turned his face and came towards Jerusalem, the Jews obviously recognized and knew that, th I mean, this is disaster. They have just made a terrible mistake. So they simply threw, they literally flung open the gates and they invited Alexander in. And it, it caused a lot of tension within the Jews because um, what became known as uh, Hellenization, and the word Hellenas or um, yeah, Hellenos means Greek or Greek uh, or Greece, uh, and you, you will see it even today still on, on the Greek flag, Hellas. Um, and and, and it, it caused a lot of friction because if you wanted to be part of the world of the day, you simply needed to follow in the footsteps of the Greek culture. Um, and, and so it caused this huge tension within the Jews as to whether they should welcome Hellenization and start learning Greek and the Greek ways and, and, and the politics of the Greeks and so on, or whether they should resist it and, and retain their own identity uh, as Jews. But during the time of Alexander and those short few years, uh, there was a, a rather good relationship. And, and again, Alexander left them to their own. In fact, he had his mind on Egypt. He went down to Egypt, came back uh, over the whole of the Mesopotamia and conquered all of that and, and didn't bother the Jews uh, from that point uh, much. There's the word Hellas on, on the Greek flag. And uh, just a few words about uh, Hellenism against the background of a statue of Alexander dating from about 330. The Persian Empire fell to the conquest of Alexander the Great in 334 to 323. Alexander had a significant impact on the life and culture of the day. He, Alexander, was impressed with the Greek culture and wanted to make one great nation out of all peoples in the world. Now, that is not new. Um, and, and certainly what happened, therefore, in subsequent empires, and more specifically when you think about uh, Hitler and his whole idea of, of stamping his authority around the whole world. I mean, it goes all the way back to the previous empires. It's, it's uh, somehow people just believe we can't all be so different. You've got to, you've got to believe what I believe. You've got to be like me sort of thing. And, and that's precisely what, um, what Alexander did. So his whole vision was to Hellenize the world. The word Hellenism comes from a Greek word which means to speak or to make Greek. And this was Alexander's mission, leading a group of Greek and Macedonian mercenaries. He swept over Asia Minor, Syria, Palestine, Egypt, and so on. Um, and he went throughout the land. Uh, and wherever he went, he established Greek city-states bearing his name, even stamping his name on it, like Alexandria in Egypt is named after Alexander the Great. And there are a few other Alexandrias uh, around the world at that particular point in time. Hellenization and the Jews. I've referred to this already. 
but it caused some major tension within the Jews and several Jews who wanted to welcome Hellenization or Hellenism uh, and those who opposed it and said, no, this is a threat to our, our own identity as Jews and also our faith uh, as believers of God. It caused much division among the Jews uh, and some infighting uh, at the end of the day while some others um, uh, welcomed it. And it's an interesting comment on JewishEncyclopedia.com that says, by introducing Hellenic culture into Syria and Egypt, Alexander the Great had probably more influence on the development of Judaism than any one individual who was not a Jew by race. Now, that's interesting. As a foreigner, Alexander the Great played a role in forming Judaism. Now, don't confuse Judaism in this reference with being an Israelite before the time. Being an Israelite and serving God, being a, a follower of Yahweh, and so on. All of those things were described in the law, the law of Moses, and, and that's how the people lived. But Judaism as a branch of, of the, or as a, as a way of serving God, developed in the intertestamental period. And so, uh, even... And a Jewish encyclopedia says that Alexander the Great played a major role in, in forming the world and forming the world view of the Jews at the time, which is quite an interesting comment. Now, as I said before, uh, at the sudden death uh, of Alexander the Babylonian um, uh, in, in Babylon, uh, it brought much confusion. Uh, there is some evidence that he had a boy in the making, or, at, or maybe even a baby boy, um, those details are a bit fuzzy, uh, but there was certainly not anybody at 33 years old, anybody old enough uh, in terms of a son of Alexander to, to be a successor of Alexander. And so obviously some of the generals who, who traveled with him, um, they uh, divided the kingdom or the empire, the Greek empire among themselves. Seleucus um, became the governor or the ruler of Mesopotamia, which is uh, much to the north from Syria, all the way around the north. Uh, Cassandra, Macedonia, which is towards Greek and Europe. Uh, and Lysimachus, uh, which inherited Thrace, which is southeast Europe. And then Ptolemy I. Uh, and again, it's, it's a lot more complicated than this, but I'm giving you the simple version uh, of the history. But Ptolemy I inherited Egypt uh, and was appointed uh, as the ruler of, of Egypt. Now, for our purposes and looking at Israel as a country and as a nation at the time, the, the first one and the last one really played the major roles uh, because these two tackled one another. The one in the north uh, over Syria and Mesopotamia and the one in the south and that is in Egypt. And poor little Israel was squashed in the middle like uh, a sandwich. And um, these two fought for power uh, regularly and, and Israel stood right in the middle of all of this and and, and, and simply, and, and almost like today, Israel played a major, a crucial role. So if I can, if I can dominate Israel or, or um, rule Israel, then I have more power than you have. And so these two rulers started fighting one another uh, over that. In the aftermath of Alexander's death, Palestine was sandwiched between Syria and Egypt, as I just said, uh, and, and it was a matter of control. And in the Battle of Ipsus in 301, Ptolemy gained control of Palestine. Seleucus controlled Syria and Asia Minor and continued his campaign for Palestine, resulting in constant battles between Syria and Egypt, leaving the Jews at the time to, to try and take sides or try and stay out of it, but also try and take sides because for, in their own interest, uh, they, they needed to, to side somewhere to make sure that for their own peace or some measure of independence uh, that the battle is won by one or the other. For the most part, the Jews were subject to Egypt during this period that we are talking about. In other words, the first uh, period after Alexander's death. It was Egypt who dominated Palestine at that particular time. And a succession of rulers, and they all became known as Ptolemy. And so we refer to the Ptolemies, uh, Ptolemy 1, 2, 3, and 4. And they all ruled in Egypt and controlled Palestine uh, at the same time. It was during this time uh, when there was freedom of travel that many Jews left Israel and traveled down south. Quite ironically, uh, when you look at the Exodus, for example, and as a group they, le they left Egypt uh, 
And Egypt always, even in the prophetic writings, picked up the reputation of the enemy, the evil, um, which in the New Testament, Babylon plays that same role. But, but Egypt was the evil one. And God punished the Egyptians uh, with all those plagues. and He saved us sort of thing. Now, during this period of time, many Jews, especially because of the war, the tension at the time, they decided they're going to move south, and they went and settled in Egypt. Now, I'm, I'm giving that bit of information because it provides you with a bit of a backdrop to the birth of Jesus. We read, when Herod tried to kill the babies, Joseph and Mary left and went and settled in Egypt for a while. They were able to do it because they, at the time of Jesus' birth, there was a large population of Jews who actually lived in Egypt and and they have gone they go all the way back to 300 or longer BC so for all these hundreds of years we had a, 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 a fair-sized Jewish population uh, in the land of Egypt there are two significant developments during this particular time that provides us again some information about our understanding of the New Testament the one is that the role of the high priest evolved into a strong political position in Israel. It was always a very uh, important position, but, but the king was the, was the monarch. He was the ruler. The priest is there to provide worship. And the priest and the king worked together. The king had his own opportunity to go up to the temple and go back again. So there was close communication and participation between the two, but they were always separate. But now in the absence of a king, and the absence of that monarch, it seems like the high priest especially became a much more stronger position. And that is going to play out uh, in the next couple of slides as we look at some of the events around Israel at the time, especially with the Romans coming onto the scene a bit later on. So hold on to that thought. The other significant development was the fact that uh, there were now so many Jews speaking Greek, and some of them lived in Egypt, and they were speaking Greek. Uh, no longer was... Uh, probably Aramaic was the common language in Palestine among the Jews, but there were so many Jews who now spoke Greek as their first language that for the first time, as far as we know, the, the Old Testament scriptures were the, translated into another language, and in this particular case, Greek. It's important and significant. Uh, we refer to it as the Septuagint, um, or LXX, which is the Roman uh, letters for uh, the number 70. And according to tradition, 70 scholars, and it, in some sources say 72, but 70 scholars came together and translated the whole of the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek. And we refer to that as the Septuagint, and we have many, many copies of the Septuagint available to us. Now, the important thing in terms of the New Testament is that whenever the New Testament quotes from the Old Testament, it quotes the Septuagint, and not the Hebrew Scriptures, which is kind of obvious, because the New Testament was all written in Greek. But there are some translation differences between the Hebrew Scriptures and the Septuagint, or the Greek Scriptures, in the Old Testament. And it's interesting that whenever the New Testament quotes, it quotes the Greek, and it doesn't go back to a, to a direct translation from uh, the Hebrew. So that just provides us a little bit of the background to the New Testament. I'll give you much more information uh, uh, after, after tea, after our break. But it leads us to the Syrian period, 200 to 142 uh, BC. The succession of rulers in Asia Minor from Seleucid the first to Antiochus the first and the second did not succeed in overcoming the Egyptians. They fought the Ptolemies, but they weren't able to overcome them. It was Antiochus III, with the help of some Jews, again inviting the Jews to help him, who won an important battle against Egypt in 198, and he then took control of Palestine. So now allegiance uh, shifted from Egypt to Syria in the north. Palestine was now under direct control of the Syrian leaders, and it introduced one of the worst periods in, in the memory of the Jews in terms of persecution under Antiochus IV. Antiochus IV, also called Epiphanes, or Antiochus IV Epiphanes, or simply Epiphanes, and there is a, a coin with his face on. Um, in 175, Epiphanes became to the, came to the throne and imposed a radical Hellenism on the Jews in hopes of strengthening his empire against the encroaching Romans. Now, that's an important little bit of information. The Romans are there, 
they, they are, they're coming. They are on, on the increase at the moment. Uh, and so that's the background. They, they have been in existence for a long while. The term Epiphanes means God is manifest. Now immediately you can see how a Jew would object to that. How can you, even in your name, because it was a sort of a nickname, his proper name or his, his mon monarch name uh, was Antiochus IV, but he adopted the name Epiphanes, which means God is manifest. It stirred up the Jews against this self-appointed deity. There was great resistance against the advancement of, of Greek culture. Antiochus' final resolve was to eradicate Judaism completely by making it a crime of death to observe the Sabbath, observe circumcision, and by burning the Holy Scriptures. Offerings were, made, uh, were to be made to the Greek god Zeus, whose image had been erected in the temple. Does it ring a little bell somewhere in the book of Daniel about an image in the temple? whose image had been erected in the temple, and in a further action of desecration of the holy place, pigs were sacrificed in the temple in Jerusalem in 167 BC. You can imagine how the Jews re reacted and responded to all of that. And that leads us to the start of a new era. But before we go there, we are going to take a break. The peace that existed since the Assyrians and certainly since the Persians disappeared when Antiochus IV came into power and started ruling over Palestine. There was a certain uh, Mattathias and he was supported by, by his five sons who started a rebellion against the Assyrians and actually fought a, a guerrilla style war against the Assyrians. Just just hitting them hard, withdrawing, hitting them hard, and so on. Um, and it started even before the desecration of the temple, but you can imagine how the Jews reacted and responded to the desecration of the temple. And it made them just uh, even more uh, uh, angry uh, and, and um, focused on getting the Syrians and all these enemies out of the country. And um, that led ultimately uh, to Jewish independence. After a time of fighting against Syria, Jerusalem was recaptured by the Jews and the temple rededicated in 164, so only a few years later. An event still celebrated today by the Jews, uh, which is referred to as the Festival of the Lights or Hanukkah uh, is another reference to that feast today. For about 100 years, Judah functioned once again as an independent state until the Romans took over in 63 uh, BC. And we learn more about these events uh, from the first book of Maccabees. In fact, first Maccabees describes for us uh, these events as they follow and gives us a, a, a huge amount of information that we otherwise would, would not have had. We, we talk about um, the Maccabean rule or the Maccabean era. <clears throat> After the death of Mattathias in 166, he was succeeded by his son Judas who established a more organized military campaign against the Syrians. Another son, Jonathan, later became governor and high priest, although he was not a priestly or Zadokite descent, as prescribed by the law. Many Jews left Jerusalem as a result of that because they believed that the, the, the high priest can only be of um, Abrahamic, um, not Abraham, um, Aaron, Aaron's descent, as well as the Zadokites and so on, which is described or prescribed in the scriptures. Under Jonathan's rule, the Jewish nation virtually became an independent state. And when he was murdered, his brother Simon was left to rule. And um, the Hasmonean period, which then uh, intersects with the Syrian period, uh, is 142 to 63 uh, BC. And um, these coins that you see on the screen actually are uh, photos of coins discovered from the Hasmonean period with different uh, inscriptions. This one right there has Hebrew uh, written on it. So they date from, from that particular time, having been uncovered by archaeologists uh, from that particular era. Simon became the first king or the leader of the Hasmonean dynasty uh, at a meeting in 141. Uh, Simon was voted to become the leader and high priest forever. Again, does, does it ring some kind of a bell uh, from the book of Hebrews? You find a similar description. Uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is a concept that already started some years before Jesus was born. When Simon was murdered, one of his sons, John, named John Hyrcanus I, became leader and king. 
And then some more coins from that particular area. Again, some, some Hebrew written on that particular one. And over here you find the uh, menorah uh, as well, or at least some kind of a reference to that. A succession of Jewish rulers reigned for about 80 years. And this was the time when the Jews were independent once again. Unfortunately for them, there was a lot of tussling and infighting and power twists within the nation at the time. Uh, people wanted to have the power. As I said, some of them left the, the city of Jerusalem or Judah and they set up themselves on, uh, in different places around the Dead Sea and in the desert and, and so on. More about that later on. But in the meantime, the Roman armies were pushing forward and they were coming. Uh, marching across the area, uh, the area and spreading the Roman influence. And in what was to become the last battle between Aristobulus II and Hyrcanus II, two major Jewish leaders who were fighting one another, um, they both called on the Romans, because the Romans were in Syria or just north, and they called on the Romans to come in and assist them to fight one another. So both of them asked for assistance, and uh, the Romans actually did come. And that leads us to the Roman period, 63 BC, and it lasted for five centuries uh, until about 476 AD. The Roman expansion in the West dates back to 300 BC, uh, slowly moving eastward from Italy, conquering nations and regions. Pompey was the one who marched against Jerusalem in 63, subjected it after a three months siege. He invaded it and took control of Jerusalem, took control of the temple, did not destroy the temple. We're now still in the second temple era, uh, as it has become known. And he sided with Hyrcanus, uh, as opposed to um, his, his enemy, and um, the high priest and, and ruler, but it came at the expense of Jewish independence. So that now they've lost the independence. The Romans said, okay, so we will rule over you. We will make our appointments uh, over you. And when the Romans replaced the Seleucids as the great power in the region, they granted the Hasmonean king, Hyrcanus II, limited authority under the Roman governor of Damascus. The Jews were hostile to the new regime, and the following years witnessed frequent insurrections. At last, an attempt to restore the former glory of the Hasmonean dynasty was made by Mattathias Antigonus, whose defeat and, and death brought Hasmonean rule to an end uh, in 40 uh, BC or BCE, and the land became a province of the Roman Empire. And that situation endured all the way through uh, the life of Jesus and the early church. Uh, on this particular slide, you will see the expansion of the Roman Empire uh, from Italy uh, over here and from Rome. Uh, it expanded in, in, se in sessions or in eras or so. Uh, first the yellow and then the green expanding even more, and then ultimately the red. Uh, and that lasted into uh, the uh, era, uh, into the early church era. There was Herod the Great. That provides us with uh, an interesting bit of backdrop or background to the New Testament. The Romans found a man by the name of Antipater, a Jewish convert from Edomia. Formerly Edomia was called Edom. Um, and so... By the time Jesus was here in the, in the first century, it was no longer called Edom, but Edomia. And um, he gained the support of the, of the Romans. He was a half-Jew, uh, half-Edomite, and in, in 37 BC, his son Herod the Great, the son-in-law of Hyrcanus II, that's where the combination comes in, was appointed as king of Judah by the Romans. The Romans appointed him as king over Judea. And um, a large, fairly large area was placed under his authority, but he in turn reported to the Romans. So it was in, in cooperation with the Romans that Herod the Great was able to rule. He was responsible for an amazing building expansion. It included uh, the harbor at Caesarea, and even modern day engineers are amazed at that. Uh, I'll tell you a quick little story. I was there in, 90, in Israel in 1994 or 1996, I don't remember the date. Um, but at the time we visited Caesarea, and Caesarea was actually built by Herod the Great and by, by um, his supporters, of course. But he was a wonderful builder and uh, an engineer. And um, at that time there was only uh, a stadium, uh, an arena that you could visit. But, but there was, build I thought it was building activity, but they were told that there are more excavations happening beyond um, the section. And when I went back last year, uh, 
uh, that whole new section in the meantime has been excavated and, and, um, and is now open to the public to go and visit. And Herod literally built himself a palace over the ocean. Part of, of his stoop was literally over the waves uh, of the Mediterranean. And there's a whole hippodrome that has been uncovered now, which was all covered by sand and dirt and everything else. And, uh, and it's just an amazing harbor that he built. There was nothing before, but he built the harbor there, Herod did. The other thing that you will visit if you go to Israel, or you should visit, is Masada. And Masada is near the Dead Sea as in the desert. I mean, there is nothing. There's almost not a green thing in sight anywhere. It is just desert, desert, sand, everything. And, and Masada looks like Table Mountain type thing. Uh, you can climb up it, but modern day people, tourists like us, go up with a cable car uh, to the top of Masada. But when you reach the top of Masada, it is amazing to see what Herod the Great had built there. He built himself a palace on Mount Masada. Uh, and it goes down in steps down. And I'm, I'm talking not just a few little steps. I'm talking about steep um, three sections of the mountain where he had his palace built. And nowadays you can go and look at the ruins of that. And we're talking about uh, the first century BC. So Herod really was, uh, was a wonderful designer. It was Herod who wanted to impress the Jews because the Jews hated him. He was an appointee of the Romans. They wanted the Romans out of the country. And Herod was not a pure Jew anyway. And so to have him as their king, they, they didn't want that. So Herod wanted to win their favor. And it was Herod who built who extended, expanded the temple. By the time in 538, when the, the Jews came back at 515, when the temple was dedicated, the second temple, it was a tiny one, not even as big as that of Solomon. But it was Herod who expanded it much bigger than that of Solomon. In fact, what was the mountain, he actually built retaining walls on the side and then filled it up and, and, and expanded the temple around the original temple area which became a large area, which, which is the one that Jesus built. It also gives you a bit more of an understanding when, when Jesus said to the Jews, you break this down, this temple, and I will build it up in three days. He was referring to himself, but they thought he was talking about the physical temple, and they said, this thing was built over 40 years, and he says he's going to rebuild it in three days. Now, that's literally true. Herod spent years building the temple and expanding it to the amazing size that it was. The Wailing Wall today is actually a retaining wall of that temple area. It's not, a, it's not one of the, the, uh, the remains of the actual original little temple or the temple itself, but it's a retaining wall, uh, and it's an impressive wall. I can guarantee you that. Whatever picture you see, uh, the Jews have excavated even further down, and it goes another three to six meters down, even underground, and even what you see has been excavated by them uh, in the meantime over the last number of years. There were always governors like Pontius Pilate and others who were uh, appointed over the country or the land uh, sort of as in support of um, either Herod or whoever, but maintaining a Roman presence in the city. Um, here is just a, a reconstruction. That's the mini Jerusalem and the mini temple as it was built. And this was the impressive building over here uh, that Herod put together based on some of the um, drawings and information that um, excavators have found. Granted almost unlimited autonomy in the country's internal affairs, Herod became one of the most powerful monarchs in the eastern part of the Roman Empire. A great admirer of Greco-Roman culture, Herod launched a massive construction program, which included the cities of Caesarea Sebasti, fortress at Herodium and Masada. He also remodeled the temple, but despite his many achievements, he failed to impress the Jews. The Jewish territories, um, this is the region uh, in green over there that Herod actually ruled over when he was appointed. He was king of the Jews, but do remember he was subject to the Romans. The Roman presence was always, uh, always there. And after his death, a similar thing happened to him to, or to the country that happened to Alexander the Great. He died in 4 BC, and the whole Jewish territory was divided into three areas each one with a ruler under Roman administration, Archelaus and Antipas and Philip. And some of them also picked up the name Herod as well. Hence, the Herods in the further part of the New Testament. Uh, they're not Herod the Great. Herod the Great died 4 BC. But when Jesus appeared before Herod, eventually it was another Herod. It was Herod Antipas at that uh, particular time. 
All right, Herod, the Herod of Jesus' time was Herod Antipas, a nickname derived from Antipatros. Uh, he was the son of the Jewish king Herod the Great and his wife Malthais. Uh, he was the full brother of Archelaus and a half-brother of Philip. With his brothers Archelaus and Philip, he was educated in Rome, a kind of honorable detention to guarantee his father's loyalty. In his father's testament, Herod Antipas was appointed tetrach of Galilee and Perea, the east bank of the Jordan. So he, he ruled over the northern part, which is why Pilate said, when he heard that Herod was in the city, he sent Jesus, no, when he heard that Jesus was from Galilee, he said, well, you've got to go and see uh, Herod, because Herod was the ruler over that northern part, the Galilee, and on the, other, on the one side of the Jordan, uh, or the Sea of Galilee, and, and um, uh, Perea on the other side uh, of the Sea of Galilee. In terms of transition, it brings us now to the close of, of what I believe to be a very, very interesting part of history. I wish we could talk more about that, and I would encourage you to read up for yourself to find out more details about these empires and, and the events. They, they well documented. But one of the questions is, why is this important? Why, why am I even going through that? Well, number one, I think I, I try and fill, up, fill in a gap uh, in our knowledge of what actually happened before Jesus. And then... We have a jump from the book of Nehemiah or the books of Nehemiah and Malachi and a few others. We have a simple jump into the New Testament. And when you arrive at the New Testament, suddenly you have Romans on the scene. Uh, you have Sadducees and Pharisees, uh, Pharisees and Sadducees and, and all sorts of parties and movements and Samaritans and other things. They are not mentioned in the Old Testament. But this period provides us with that information to make the transition in our minds so that we can then much better read the New Testament against this kind of background. Now because of this era, more than any others, I believe that God prepared the world for the birth of Jesus Christ. And in the next part of our lecture, I'm going to look at some of the ways in which God has prepared the world for Jesus to be born. And I call it some of the social, political and religious developments during the silent years. And one of the things that I want to highlight is the Jewish diaspora, uh, or diaspora, whichever pronunciation you prefer, uh, the Jewish dispersion. I've already alluded to this when I talked about Egypt, but the Jews scattered. It started in 722. Perhaps before that, because the situation was a, a, probably a lot more complex than we can even imagine. But these, the Jews who, who went into exile in 722, the northern kingdom, they never came back in bulk. Now, they may have drifted back in family or individuals and so on, but we never read about the reestablishment of the northern kingdom. Something similar happened in 586 with the fall of Jerusalem. More Jews scattered. We now have evidence in the Bible that some of them never came back. Nehemiah, Daniel, Esther, those remained uh, in the places where they were. Now, what is not described in the, New Te in the Old Testament for us is the fact that many other Jews also scattered. We, we, we've seen evidence of Jews going to Egypt. The same thing happened to the north, especially under Antiochus Epiphanes. People just scattered. They didn't want to stay for the persecution. So they, they moved. They moved north. Some of them were forcibly moved. Others of their own free will, just fled the country. And they moved north. They moved to Syria. They moved to Asia Minor. And they moved all the way to uh, places in Europe and, and the Greek islands and so on. The interesting thing is that when Paul started his missionary journeys, what did he do? He touched base with Jews wherever they lived. And I believe the Jewish diaspora or diaspora prepared the way for the gospel to reach those, uh, those places. Uh, I mean, I, I don't pick up here in South Africa and, and move into, let's say, um, let, let me try and find a nation, China. Um, because I don't know too many South Africans who live in China. If I don't have a connection in China, I think I would have a slightly better chance if I go to Australia or London today. I would find plenty of South Africans over there. And, and I would have almost an, a welcome. You know, here's another South African coming. I want to tell you a new message. I would look for people like me speaking my language and understanding my culture because I would be able to share the gospel with them. And that's precisely what Paul and the other missionaries did. They looked for Jews. That was their touch point in every single city. So God was not silent. He was silent not speaking, but God was not inactive. He was preparing the world years before Jesus came. 
in sending Jews, scattered them around the world. Now, the Greek language is another proof of the way that God was working in preparing the world. In Israel, people spoke Aramaic. Jesus spoke Aramaic. It was a Semitic language related to Hebrew, as we saw last week or the week before. But Hellenization ensured the spread of Greek as the common language of the time. It became the lingua franca of the day. It's almost like we are using English today. And wherever you go, you, people want to learn uh, English. Last year I went on a mission trip to Thailand. Some of our missionaries there are using this as a way to establish relationships with people. They offer English. And people actually write to them and contact them and say, and say we want to come and study English. And so using English as the language, they're able to share the gospel. Now, in this particular case, Greek became that language, the common language. And the whole of the New Testament is evidence of the fact that this was the language spoken and that Paul and others used to write up the whole of the New Testament. Now, tell me, 300 years before Jesus was born, God prepared the world for the language to be used for the gospel to spread into the world. 300 years before. I mean, I, I, I'm astonished when I think about that. It blows my mind that God can plan it so well in advance. And of course, it proves the fact that God is God. Roman infrastructure, 63, and even before, I mean, 300 B.C., the Romans already came onto the scene. But by 63 B.C., they, they were now well established as the Roman Empire. By that time, they, they took Palestine. And, um, and the Jews became subject to them. From the earliest times, the Romans displayed remarkable skill at building and engineering. They constructed bridges across the river Tiber, aqueducts to supply Rome with water, and sewers to drain the forum and keep the city healthy. As they expanded their power across Italy, the Romans linked the capital with other communities they had conquered by a network of roads, so well designed that many still lie beneath the motorways of modern Italy. And even till today, they excavate and find Roman roads, where the Romans just built roads and bridges and everywhere. And till today, engineers marvel at the skills of the Romans. And the Romans provided an infrastructure that the gospel was able to go around freely. Today, you and I, uh, if you're a South African like I am, you need a visa to go to Britain. I mean, of all places. These people didn't need any visas. They had the freedom to travel. They had the roads to travel. They, I mean, Paul and others just, just traveled everywhere because the road system was there for them to do so. There was relative peace during that time. The Roman Empire boasted the Pax Romana, as it became known, or the Peace of Rome. It was a period somewhere between 27 BC and 180 AD during which time there was no major war. There were skirmishes and, and little rebellions here and there and everywhere, a little um, put, put down a fire over here. But there was no major war during that time, which meant that Paul and others could travel freely around the world using the Pax Romana, uh, the freedom of Rome, to travel uh, without much uh, disturbance. International travel uh, became well used in those days. It was there before, but the Romans just made it so much easier with their ships and their, uh, and their roads and the system that they designed. The Pax Romana, Roman citizenship, uh, and an in, an excellent infrastructure, all provided an opportunity for Christian missionaries to travel freely uh, around the world. Uh, just one quick example. Paul used the citizenship of Rome to protect him from time to time. He was able to say, you, you cannot... You cannot uh, condemn me without a court. In fact, when he stood uh, in, in Caesarea, that very city I mentioned before, when he stood in Caesarea before Felix and Agrippa and others, uh, he said, I, I appeal to the Caesar. As a Roman citizen, he had the right to ask the very top person in the empire to, to preside at his, at his hearing. And, and that's exactly what he did. And that is why he was eventually sent uh, to Rome. And he had the right to do so. And the Roman citizenship provided him with that. Again, it provided for, um, for that freedom of the gospel. And this is precisely what I'm saying on, on this slide. Paul was able to use this privilege not only to, to travel freely, but also to provide him with protection when he needed it. There are a few developments prior to the coming of Jesus that are simply assumed uh, 
when you read the New Testament. Let me lead you through just a few of those uh, to help us to give us a better picture of the background of the New Testament. All of these developments during the time uh, of the silent years or the 400 years before Jesus came. There was the Jewish messianic expectation. By the latter half of the first century, the monarchy was only a distant memory. Um, there, there was no king. For the last 400 years, there, for the last almost 500 years, there was no king. And so there was this desire for a king, but the reality, we're under Roman authority, uh, we're probably never going to have uh, our own king again. And so the concept of a Messiah king developed extremely strongly. The evidence is there in the extra-biblical literature uh, that we have. Apart from the Old Testament and prophecies we have in the Old Testament, uh, the evidence is there that people grappled with this issue. And by the time Jesus came, it was almost like the nation was ready for a Messiah-type figure. The, the sad part is they had a particular description for him, and therefore Jesus didn't fit the description. And for the most of them, they rejected Jesus as a result of that. But this figure would come in the line of David. He would be the son of David. Uh, like David, David was their king. And even till today, the, the star of David and David's city, and David plays this role. And so in the line of David, the Messiah uh, would come. In addition to that, what I told you before, almost a fusion of different kinds of political positions and religious positions like the king, the priest, and then also later, and, and we will talk about that more in the second module, but um, later on the prophetic uh, position that developed. And it's interesting that Jesus, when he came, fulfilled all three of those positions, king, priest, and prophet uh, in, one, in one person. But already when Jesus came, it was not a foreign concept that the leader, the king, and the priest would be the same person. And we've seen that in the developments uh, during those years. Jewish theology developed uh, very strongly in this time. Um, the perceived silence on the part of God during the 400 years before Christ created a vacuum and a yearning for his prophetic voice to be heard once again. Uh, hence the, the question to John the Baptist, are you the one? whom we are expecting. You remember that question from the New Testament. Now, all of what happened in the 400 years before created that vacuum. They were yearning, they were waiting for someone to come. And so they asked John, are you it? And then many people found Jesus to be the Messiah. And they obviously believed him. Many others rejected him, of course. But there was this theological speculation. The other thing that happened during this time was rabbinical schools. Um, we, we don't have them in the Old Testament ever. But in this period, during this time period, the, the rabbis developed as a position. They were the teachers. They, they taught the community. They taught the children. And more specifically, if you wanted to become a disciple, and we have the evidence in the Jewish writings all over about these different rabbis, a rabbi like Gamaliel. And Paul says to us, I, I studied at the feet of Gamaliel. It was a very common thing to do. You have these leaders, and uh, there was Hillel and Gamaliel and, and all those uh, rabbis. And, and there's no wonder that oftentimes Jesus, called, Jesus was called by people rabbi uh, in, in their address of him because they would see him as a rabbi. So when Jesus came and started teaching, it was nothing new. It was a very well-known concept. Another thing was uh, the Jewish synagogues that prepared the way for the gospel. Uh, with the spreading and the dispersion of Jews around the world, somehow, because people lived so far away from the temple, the temple was the only place where Jews would sacrifice. Even till today, they, they don't sacrifice today because the temple is not there. The synagogues never replaced the sacrificial system, but the synagogue became the center of Jewish community. That's where they taught, that's where they read the law, that's where they came together to worship and read more, because they were miles away, sometimes countries away, from Jerusalem, and they never had an opportunity to get to Jerusalem. And here you have a picture, a photograph, in fact, that, that, that I took of the... Um, no, 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 I didn't take this one. Uh, this is of the synagogue in Capernaum. And the foundations of this synagogue goes back to the time of Jesus. And so when you visit Israel and you walk into that particular area, you know that the foundations, not the walls, but the foundations go back to the time of Jesus. Right next to it are the excavations of Peter's house, uh, with, with now a church built over it with a, with a glass floor in the middle. You can look down onto what is believed to have been Peter's house, where Jesus healed Jesus, uh, Peter's mother-in-law. 
The name synagogue comes from the Greek word sunagoge, and it means an assembly or a gathering place. And this is how the Jews started gathering. And although dating from the time before the birth of Christ, synagogues in the cities and towns became the main place of worship for Jews after the fall of Jerusalem, especially when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. Um, the synagogues started playing a much more important role. The synagogues became the model for the first, uh, for the first and second century Christians. They modeled their, their gatherings and sometimes even their buildings after the synagogues because it's all they knew was the synagogues and how they were constructed. The remains of over a hundred synagogues in Palestine and another 20 in other countries have been identified. So synagogues were actually in Palestine itself, but also in other countries all the way down to, to even Egypt. And as a Jew, Paul had free access uh, to the synagogues. And similar to uh, what Jesus experienced when he was in the, syn in the synagogue in Capernaum, uh, Jesus was handed a scroll and said, do you have anything to say? Jesus read from the scroll of Isaiah. There was another occasion in a foreign city when Paul went to the synagogue and the synagogue leaders said to Paul, do you have anything to say to us? And it was Paul as a Jew had all the right to enter into the synagogue and to speak in the synagogue as well and prepared the way for him. He had a captive audience every time he went to a city and there was a synagogue. And then there were the Jewish parties that we find in the New Testament. Um, we don't know much about their origins. They have been searched and researched and, 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 and uncovered or tried to uncover. But unfortunately, we do not know where they come from. And that includes the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They sort of gradually emerged and came onto the scene. By the time of Jesus, it's simply assumed. Uh, it's an assumed situation, and we don't know exactly where they uh, originated. And we are, for the most part, uh, dependent on some of these extra-biblical literature to try and, and capture that information. Just a brief word about the Pharisees. This group was the major or dominant party in Jesus' time in Palestine. It wasn't always the case. The Sadducees, before, in the years before Jesus came, they dominated. But by the time Jesus, the Pharisees dominated the scene. Um, and the word Pharisee is derived probably from the Hebrew word that means separated ones. They really regarded themselves as separated from sin and the sinful people out there, and, and they were the holy ones sort of thing, and that's uh, the name, that's where the name comes from. Their origin, again, as I said, unknown, but probably developed in the last two centuries B.C. The first reference to them as a group is found in the late second century B.C., about 130 B.C., we, we find reference to them, but we, we, again, they, they just assumed as a group that is in existence. They were known for their passion for the law and the protection of the traditions of the forefathers. And then there were the Sadducees. That was the other major party, religious party that we find. Again, the, the origin is unknown, but they probably date from roughly the same time as that of the Pharisees. They were mainly represented by the upper class, whereas the Pharisees represented the middle and lower class of the people. Sadducees regarded themselves as upper class, uh, wealthy people. Together with the Pharisees, they formed the Sanhedrin. Uh, and that functioned like a parliament. By the time Jesus came, no king anymore, hated the, Jews, uh, hated the, the Herod uh, or the Herods, uh, and the Romans and everybody else, and their internal affairs, if you wish, the, especially the religious affairs of the Jews, were overseen by the Sanhedrin. Again, we simply find the Sanhedrin there suddenly out of the blue uh, in the New Testament. The Pharisees believed in eternal life, in angels and so on. The Sadducees rejected all of, of those things. And then there were the Essenes. I've referred to them briefly before. Uh, against the background of some of the caves in which the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. And this is really what the situation looks like over here. It's desert country. It really, really is desert country. And this is one, one of the reasons why those scrolls survived for uh, almost 2,000 years or so. The Essenes, um, this is uh, a word that is not known from the New Testament, but the Qumran community could have been an example of such a community. And here again is a quote from Wikipedia. Uh, they were a Jewish religious group that flourished from the 2nd century BC to the 1st century AD. Many separate but related religious groups of that era shared similar mystic, eschatological, messianic, and ascetic beliefs. 
These groups are referred to by various scholars as the Essenes. It's not a, it's not a group as such, but it's, a, it's a, a group name for several different kinds of groups, such as the Dead Sea Scroll community. It may be, when you read the New Testament, that John the Baptist, when he went into the desert, and he had all these funny habits like wearing uh, sackcloth and uh, skins and eating uh, uh, all sorts of little animals and things, it may be that John had some kind of contact with these people. But we wouldn't regard him as one of those groups, but he may have had some contact with groups like that. The Samaritans is another interesting study. Um, the origins of the Samaritans are not known. Uh, although the Jews would refer to 2 Kings chapter 17, with the fall of Samaria, the Assyrians brought in some other nations to replace some of the Jews that they took into captivity. And, and the, the 2 Kings 17 uh, tells us that there was a mixture of religion and all sorts of habits during that particular time. The Jews are saying that's where the Samaritans originated. The Samaritans say, no, we are not associated, we've never been associated with the city of Samaria, and they have a whole long history, and a very, very interesting history as well. They have their own beliefs, they have the first five books of Moses, they changed some of that uh, a little bit, they have their own script as well, but we, we refer to that as the Samaritan Pentateuch. Uh, and when you do, uh, and, and we'll look at that next week, when you, when you do a little bit of the study of how the Bible was transmitted, then the Samaritan Pentateuch helps us as a witness to the Old Testament as well. And interestingly enough, they have always been associated with Shechem and not Samaria, but they are still in existence still today. By the turn of the century, the last century, they almost were extinct. But then their leadership gave permission to some of the young men, Samaritans, to marry Jewish girls. And then they assured or um, they, they regained their strength. And, and they're, they're not large in number, but there are two communities of Samaritans today in Israel. One is in Nablus, uh, which is in, on the West Bank, uh, West Bank Territory. And the other one is near uh, Tel Aviv. Samaritans accept their own version of the Torah, the Samaritan Pentateuch, uh, and they still have a high priest, and they still celebrate uh, sacrifices, and especially the Passover feast, uh, when they slaughter an animal and sacrifice that to God. Here is Masada. And if you look at this particular picture, here are the, re the, re the remains of Herod's building. He's um, a sort of a palace or a, a fortress that he built. Now look at the steep decline over there and another one down there to the bottom. I mean, all of that and with, with the equipment that they had in those days, I mean, modern engineers marvel at how they actually got the stuff up there and then to build it. I mean, and it wasn't just a bunch of stones. I'm talking about hothouses uh, like saunas and, 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 and equipment and there is almost no rain. There is no water there. There's no natural water on that mountain. But they devised a system of of catching rainwater whenever it did rain and then keeping them in these cisterns that they dug out of solid rock to provide the water for uh, people who lived up there. And this was sort of his winter palace that he went to at times. The Zealots, they are a, a Jewish faction traced back to the revolt of the Maccabees in the 2nd century BC. The name was first recorded by the Jewish historian Josephus as a designation for the Jewish resistance fighters of the war, A.D. 66 to 73. That's around about the fall of Jerusalem. And this is also the time when uh, the zealots or some people moved on to Masada and held out against the Romans until the Romans uh, approached them and, and had that ramp. And on the last day, just before they went in, uh, those Jews all committed suicide, or uh, that is how the story goes. The zealots were organized as a party during the, reign, during the reign of Herod the Great, somewhere between 37 and 4 BC. And then there was the Jewish Sanhedrin. I have referred to that already. By the time of Jesus, the Jews were governed by Roman officials with a king appointed by the Roman authorities, for example, Herod the Great and other Herods. Since the Jews operated like a theocracy, in, in other words, God ruling over them, their politics and religion were very closely linked. And um, the best example of, the, uh, example of this is the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin became like the parliament of their day, especially in the area of religious uh, uh, issues. Uh, and, but those religious issues spilled very, very strongly over into political and other areas, social life uh, as well. 
how the Sanhedrin came into existence is no longer known, uh, but Josephus is the first one who wrote that, that the Romans convened a meeting of the political Sanhedrin in about 57 BC. So we know that they were in existence by 57 BC. Um, about the Sanhedrin, um, the, the Tanaic, Tanaitic sources describe the great Sanhedrin as a religious assembly of 71 sages who met in the chamber of hewn stones in the temple in Jerusalem. So that's where they met. And so that's where Paul appeared before the Sanhedrin. That's where Jesus appeared before them uh, eventually uh, and so on. And they sat in a semicircle and they had their discussions. By way of conclusion, um, I provided a little bit of the backdrop uh, to the New Testament. There are many other developments that I could have highlighted and, and that we can and I encourage you to look into uh, perhaps. But uh, at the moment we know enough. There's a lot that we do not know, but we know enough to know that God, as I've said now several times, God was not inactive. God was busy preparing the world to bring Jesus into the world and to allow the gospel to spread uh, around the world. So, as you go this week and, and, um, and, and look at your notes again, uh, I, I'm, I'm asking you just to, uh, to confirm and to affirm the things that we have talked about tonight. And, and, and even as you pray, uh, thank the Lord for His involvement in this world. And um, on a mini scale, maybe an opportunity for you to look into your own life and say, you know, I haven't always understood exactly why it happened this way. Why I was given this set of parents. Or why I have gone through that experience. But when you look back, as, as I can do on many, many things in my own life, I can see God's hand in my life. I can see how God was busy preparing me for whatever He had and still has uh, in mind for me. Now next week we'll look at another topic, your reflective essay, which is not a massive assignment, but is due in week six, so please don't forget that. It's week four now, so another two weeks and you need to hand in that one assignment. And then for next week you need to memorize all the books, the names of the books of the uh, Old Testament. And next week we're going to look at Bible transmission. And that is how um, the Bible was transmitted especially before the discovery of the printing press. So that's the topic for next week. Now I'll see you next week and may the Lord bless you.